The issues on the supposed leak tape that was allegedly plotting the removal of the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Akofo Dampare, over the last few weeks seem to be growing some tentacles. That would be despite the appearance before the committee by the police officers implicated in this very recording. And as you are aware, uh, the IGP himself also has appeared before the committee telling his side of the story. And within the same week, Bugri Nabu, uh, the person who first appeared before the committee because people believed that the video or the recording emanated from him, uh, had to reappear before the committee as well as the National Security Minister, Albert Kandapa. But whilst Ghanaians are trying to just think about these issues that are in the public domain, the former president, John Nahama, once again also spoke about the judiciary and accused the current government of packing the court with pro-MPP judges. And you are aware that the president has responded to this issue, but it seems the venue he used to respond to this issue has also generated some debate. And of course, some other issues happening in the country. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Town Hall Talk. My name is Beatrice Edu, and tonight on Town Hall Talk, we'll be delving into these issues, and our guest on the program is Her Ladyship Sophia Akufo. Her Ladyship Sophia Akufo was recently the chief Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana. Prior to this, she was a judge at the Supreme Court. She was also a judge at the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And we'll be discussing all these issues with her and uh, her possible recommendations moving forward on some of these issues that are dominating discussions. Uh, good evening to you, ma'am. And thank you so much for joining us on Town Hall Talk. Good evening. So let's start off with the issue that is dominating discussions now, as I just talked about the leaked audio tape recording involving the former uh, Northern Regional Chairman of the governing uh, party, Bukri Nabu, on a supposed plot to remove the IGP uh, and the rippling effect, as it, as it were, regarding what we've heard and what we are seeing. As someone who has occupied the highest position in the judiciary, what are your preliminary comments? Um, I cannot make any judicial pronouncement on any of, of this. But uh, all I can say is that there's a parliamentary process that it has been initiated because the parliament wants to understand what had happened. And um, I, 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 I'm, I do not really want to talk about whether it's too, it, it, it is going too far it is going it's going to it's too extensive it's delving into extensive matters but all that matters to me is that the process there's a something in process i believe in pro things that are in process they have to be done and pursued in a in with integrity with with uh, with in in proper context with uh, due process so that people are able People who are brought into the matter are also able to, um, these days, you young people, you say, to come and remove their mouth in the, in the mouth. That's she transliteration yes. there. Yes, <laughs> to, 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 to respond if charges are made against them or allegations are made against them. Um, I think that... Uh, we, as a nation, we do need to be careful when it's any matter to do with our military, to do with our police, to do with uh, administrative processes and procedures. Um, not that they shouldn't come into the public domain. The more that we know about how things are done or how things are supposed to be done, the better for all of us. As I said, process integrity. If everybody knows what the process is supposed to be, then allegations don't get made except justifiably. Then hopefully there will be less external and excessive interference with the process. You just talked about allegations not being made or if they are made justifiably. I hear you make a point of 
integrity of process. And also the fact that as part of integrity of process, we need to be careful what we say as these processes are going on. But again, the concern and indeed when we watched or as we continue to watch the processes as uh, they are being telecast or they are being uh, live streamed for all Ghanaians to watch, you see comment of, oh, we feel that too much is being revealed, like COP, Alex Mensah. I know you wouldn't want to go into the specific details no, of what they said, but the personal information or quote-unquote attacks on, on the person of the IGP and the IGP coming in to respond to some of those things. And to a certain extent, I remember the chairman reminding the IGP that don't forget some of what you're saying in camera. But at the end of the day, a lot of the things he said, some people still felt that probably it was too much information in terms of the effect it could have or the implications it could have. Based on what you've heard so far, do you really see anything that we have been exposed to that ideally should have been in camera? A lot of what we've been exposed to that I've been listening to, because I am very selective with what I choose to listen to. Um, a lot of it, has, there's been a lot of personal conjecture. There's been a lot about um, personal feelings being vented out on the public domain. A few times my reaction has been, I wish this, all this, they, in, they were internal processes within the police service to enable people to vent out because you could see there was a lot of venom and hard feelings and bitterness and so on and so forth. And it, it was, a, it, it, to me, unseemly. So it was untidy for you? It, it was untidy. And it was, and the question was, because I, I felt, I'm one who likes to stick to the issues. And um, if the inquiry is about where, what was being said on a tape, and the, what was being set, said on the tape was a plot to get rid of, not to kill, but to, to unseat the, the IGP. Um, personal feelings are quite irrelevant to the... The, um, to the process the, and the probe. Absolutely, because the issue was basically, in its distilled form, is... Well, is that your voice? Did you or did you not say it? And the furthest they could go would be, why, why would you say that, seeing as even the powers and the role and the function of the IGP sh should not have anything to do with the, an election process? In other words, these questions that you're asking, if they were asked, should have ended the whole process? I believe so. It, but now it's been allowed to bleed into the, the entire police structure, its administration, its um, how people are recruited, basically. It's gone into recruitment, it's gone into their disciplinary processes, it's gone into how people are promoted, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's an inquiry which has now become open-ended. I'm waiting to see what the report will come up with. In other words, you agree with those who think that the entire country is investigating a gossip which should have been handled internally? I'm not going to say it was a gossip or whatever, but we, we've gone too far. There's too many other things we need to be focusing on. There was, a, there was an explosion. How did that happen in, in uh, what's that place? That is in the Western region. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And also something like that. Yes. How, how was it possible for such an activity to be going on where it was going on? Was it a licensed activity? I would be more interested. Especially when we had Apiate. Uh, absolutely. So since Apiate, what, what preventive measures have been put in place generally? and things like that. Just to wrap up the conversation on this one, I will read the terms of reference for this committee as published by Graphic Online. It says, establish the authenticity of the leaked 
audio recording, investigate the conspiracy to remove the current IGP, investigate any other matter contained in the audio recording, recommend sanctions to persons found culpable where applicable or where appropriate, make recommendations for reforms where necessary, and make such other recommendations and consequential orders as the committee might deem appropriate. Yes, but... Uh, if I know anything about authorization, author, there's, the, there's the big authorization, the specific authorization. And there's normally the, we used to say the portmanteau clause where other things are put in. But it doesn't mean that if you're supposed to be uh, going uh, to, um, let's say, traveling to South Africa, in December, and you can pack whatever you like. You should pack bikinis and things like that because you're going to South Africa in the winter. That's the authorities to go there for the winter. Do you see what I mean? Yes. And so the portmanteau doesn't have to include everything. The so you would despise this yeah. reference or terms of reference. You it still, still has its that limitations. It, the, the committee probably is still going beyond. I, I think there has been too much kite flying. You know, a lot of kite flying. What would you say then about the invitation of the National Security Minister and, 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 uh, reappearance of Bugri Nabu, probably to, to explain further, but for the National Security Minister, you think that it's gone to that extent, even... Well, that's why, thank goodness, his part, and I, from what I understand, everything going on is going to be in camera. Too much has been outside. That's, that's, that's enough. I just talked about the fact that the, the committee, I just read a, the reference to you, and we talked about appropriate sanctions were or sanctions were appropriate how far because i heard the chairman uh, wrapping up the sitting when the igp was before before the committee saying that we should be reminded that the committee has prosecutorial powers or that of a high court i'm speaking to a supreme court judge here but how far can the committee go in terms of recommendations or sanctions and any other as contained in its terms of reference? Like I said, I haven't really paid a close attention to most of this. But all I can say also is that there's also the, a whole body of legislative instruments um, from enactment from the constitution to enactments to regulations and internal processes and procedures within the police service, which are also applicable. And at the end of the day, whatever sanction, if somebody is going to be sanctioned, is it going to be what? A criminal sanction? Or is it going to be an administrative sanction? They have their own administrative structures, which, once again, process integrity, I hope, will not be sidelined. What would you recommend? I do not make recommendations in the air. No, everything in the end, if it's going to be sanctioning of people, it's not parliament that sanctions people. Parliament can recommend in these circumstances. But unless they're going to recommend changing the law, but these things have already happened. And if they're going to change the law, it can only be applicable, prospective, not retrospective. The former president, John Mahama, has been in the news for another comment on the judiciary where he accused the current government, led by President Takofado, of packing or loading the courts with MPP judges and he promising to balance the equation when or if he's elected president. How does this comment sit with you as a former chief justice? Whether as former chief justice, whether as former judge, whether as a, a continuing citizen of Ghana, it doesn't sit comfortably with me. The judiciary, as an arm of government, is, 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 is one which needs and must always be kept 
separated from political activity. Firstly, has anybody produced anybody's uh, party card? And in any case, what is important is not whether you are a card-bearing member of any party. What is important is at the end of the day, what work you're going to do on the bench. And that is governed by a very powerful oath of office that you make when you come in to the, to the, to the bench. And I must say that it always upsets me when you get comments like, oh, this one is NPP uh, judge. This one is NDC judge. This one is for the, this other party. This one is for that other party. And yet you've never seen the person, let's say, on, on any party's uh, you know, rally platform, uh, rallying the crowd and things like that. And, you, and you're only conjecturing one because the person is being nominated by the president. And unfortunately, in our constitution, the president is the one who appoints. He's the appointing authority, whether we like it or not. Apparently, that's how it is. So at any particular point in time, there will be a president, even if we have a president who is an independent, there will still be a human being who is appointing judges. Is that not so? So if we keep jumping to these conclusions, and then, you know, it, and it's been going on, let's face it, it's been going on in this country for the longest time. When I was appointed by uh, President Rawlings. I became an NDC judge. When I make a decision against the NDC, ah, I became an MPP judge, and so on and so forth. And these are some of the unnecessary pressures that are put on, on, on the judiciary. What if it's not by anybody saying, go this way or that way, but public perception sometimes it gets to you. How did it get to you? For me, it got to me simply, well, no, me, the very little gets to me, except to do the work I have to do. And I must say that up to now, I still believe that 99.99% of the judiciary, from magistrate all the way up to the chief justice, they are there to simply do their work. The facts, the proven facts, not conjecture, the proven facts, the law, and then you, you analyze. Yes, you can go wrong in the analysis. That's why there are um, appeal processes. So the judiciary is there to also observe, once again, process integrity. Yes. And so this, I think, gives me an opportunity to talk about something which I think we need to be seriously thinking about in this country. The fact that the constitution says these positions are to be appointed by so-and-so, that's a fact, that's the appointing authority. But it is always also open to build um, institutional structures on methodology. On, on process, on procedure, so as to be able to enhance accountability and transparency. Whether it's the appointment of the IGP, whether it's the appointment of um, the Chief Justice, whether it's the appointment of the head of the army, all these appointments, it will be really fabulous if systems, and, and processes are put in place, known by everybody. This is how it so is So you're looking done. at transparency here. So then Absolutely. at the end of the day, nobody so goes that, to say yes, that. Yes, because I, it, 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 as you, you asked me how did it affect me. I was actually going to ask you again because it, I haven't had a last it, 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 my, it, it affected me, especially when I was made Chief Justice. Personally, I knew I was qualified for it. I was qualified Professionally, I was qualified 
um, chronologically. I was qualified uh, also administratively. I was qualified. I, I, I had a broad knowledge of administrative processes and because of other things I've done before. But I know that. But who else knows that? And unless you go and somehow go and find my file somewhere, which is supposed to be confidential and so on and so forth. So I would have loved it if there was a sort of public process whereby not, it's not that fast that takes place before parliament. That one is at the end of the, towards the end of the process. But at the upfront, these are the people who are being considered. And then there should be some, some open process. Yeah. Then there are countries now, with, even within the, common, the Commonwealth, who have set up uh, commissions simply for dealing with judicial appointment. Did it in any way influence or make you doubt certain decisions because you felt, uh, if I don't take care, they would tag me A or B whilst you were doing your work? Never. Never. Why? What difference will that tag make to me, my career, and my work? I'm already there. So you think I'm, in, I'm MPP. At the end of the day, so what? Hmm? You think I'm NDC. At the end of the day, so what? You think um, I'm CPP. Therefore, look at the judgment. But how, how do you... But you see, you see, what is important is not... Is, I was talking about public perception. Think of a very young magistrate. Let's say, how old are you? Oh, you don't want to say so. <laughs> anyway, you look very pretty. But let's assume you're, you, you, you're a new magistrate. That's at the lowest level of the, of the judiciary. Oh, system. And so you're the magistrate for whatever town. Hey, however young you are, however new you are, you are the magistrate. You are the judicial, the fundamental, the basic judicial authority in that district. When uh, somebody who's about twice your mother's age appears before you and you decide guilty until it is appealed against, that has the force of law and it will be enforced by the entire enforcement powers of the executive because this young person says this one is guilty. And or that you know that somebody is uh, somebody should give up something, or or your you, you, your title to land it should be handed over to somebody else. All these are ways of ensuring that conflict, dispute, disagreements are settled in a certain way, which will have a, have meaning to. Both parties, yes. But if you keep throwing things at it so that the public reaches the point where, oh, I lost my case because the judge is NDC or because the judge is MPP. Is that right? When we do that, we're chipping away at the very fabric of justice. And justice is to help um, determine relationships. That's the most general way I can put it. In a way that each side of the relationship accepts as binding. And if they don't accept as binding, they will then follow the process to the next level, which is um, an appeal. Yes, that's why you can, a matter that, a decision that's made by a magistrate over the period, appeal, 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 can end up before the, even the, the, the Supreme Court. I'm glad you talk about the processes we need to have to protect our judicial integrity, using your word here again. But I want to ask process you... Process integrity. Judicial process integrity and process integrity. Process integrity. Things. Well, two different sides of the same coin. Yes. yes. 
Uh, but I'm wondering what you think of this very comment coming from a former president who has had the opportunity of equally appointing judges if there were vacancies. I find it an unfortunate statement. As you have said, he's been through uh, the process of uh, appointing other people before. So was it because they were NDC? What, why? Because that's, as I keep asking, do you ask for, well, nobody has, well, for one thing, I've never held any party's card. <laughs> but uh, even if I, nobody has ever asked me throughout my career, from being a young person, finding a job in Ghana Airways, all the way to finally retiring as Chief Justice. Nobody has actually ever asked me what's my politics. Because it's so totally unrelated to whatever function I'm supposed to be performing. If I'm supposed to be the legal advisor, I was once the, the legal, an illegal officer uh, and deputy company secretary at Ghana Airways. Nobody asked me, are you uh, in favor of the military government? It was during military government. Do you favor the military government? Does it matter whether I favor military government or not? I'm there to ensure that the interests of the Republic of Ghana is properly covered. But you must be, uh, I'm sure you've also heard that the president responded to it. He went to the Ghana Bar Conference and he's been attacked as well. Ah, uh, well, you know, everybody has how they, their own methods and their own ways of responding to things. Because um, I didn't listen to what uh, the, the His Excellency the President said, but um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I don't, I really don't know what the uh, theme, he said, he said, what the theme of the meeting of the, this year's conference was. The, the GBA that, feels that the president used this platform, which wasn't a political platform, to respond to a political issue. Well, yeah, because he's a politician. I'm not a politician. I don't know how politicians think. They, are, they, they have their own way of doing things, and uh, I have my own way of doing things. The things you spend a lot of your adult life doing end up influencing how you, 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 you think. 24 years of my of my life were spent uh, being a judge and before then more years were spent being a lawyer protecting the interest of my client and uh, so focuses are different and i and uh, i think it's unfortunate i think it's whatever is it is it's unfortunate that uh, one appointment of the judiciary should be thrown into a, a political cesspit in 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 such in such a way, and because I I want to sit here and declare that the appointment of judges is not and ought not be political, in as much and the uh, promotion well judges don't get promoted they get. Uh, appointed and they get elevated because the fact that you're a magistrate doesn't mean that you will necessarily become anything other than a magistrate. Yes. So appointments to key public positions are not supposed to be political. The, 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 the fact that you, you describe or in as much as you describe the comment as unfortunate, we've had some party executives, for instance, a deputy communications minister, Felix Kachofosu, uh, disagreed. In fact, this is what he said. He said that he sees what the president, as in President Akufuado, condemning the comments of former President Mahama. He see what uh, he sees what the president said as a form of intimidation. And then went on to say, no amount, that's Felix Kachofosu, uh, no amount of intimidation will prevent members of the opposition National Democratic Congress from fighting for, quote unquote, fairness and balance in the administration of justice in Ghana. Well, I, I am not, who am I to label what somebody has said as one thing 
or the other. What well, somebody's intimidation is another person's emboldment, right? So uh, that is neither here nor there. Fighting for justice in Ghana is the duty of every Ghanaian of whatever age uh, and 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 uh, and political color. That is our duty. That's, that is even required of us by the constitution itself. So, and it's also in our interest that due process is, due process is observed in everything and anything. So That's I'm, why I keep talking about process integrity. One, state the process. Let's get to the point where we establish processes and procedures and then uh, move on. But let me explain something to you. Somehow people are under the impression that um, the president gets up and decides, make this one a judge, make this one a judge. This one is going to become a judge. All, all of you come to um, Jubilee House and be sworn in. No, to become a magistrate, there's a whole application process. It's advertised. There are exams. There are short, there's interviewing. And then there's shortlisting. And then after the shortlisting, that's when they do the um, character investigations and all that. And then somebody gets appointed. And then you're supposed to be doing your work and your work is also being constantly reviewed and so on and so forth reviewed not what was it in favor of the ndc or was it in favor of the npp no do you know your law basically that's all there is to it do you know your law are you a hard-working judge how do you how well do you manage your cases how long do cases remain with you. Are you one of those judges or magistrates who the simplest thing, three years, four years, five years, you're not doing anything about it. That these are part of the, 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 the work of the supervising high court judges and of the uh, chief justice to be tracking the performance of, of judges. So if these are there, why would a former president who has been a president before say that and also have like his one uh, his aide uh, Joyce Bar Mukhtari in fact quoting outrightly saying that an ultra useless pronouncement from a president as that's in referring to what the uh, president said from a president who has completely debased the presidency promoted corruption politicized the judiciary with pro mpp appointments and yet things making uncouth political statements at a bar conference uh, will wash him up now that kind of statement by that whoever Said Joyce Bar Mokhtari. I, st I still don't know who it is. It, it, doesn't, aid ma to the it doesn't matter to me. Uh, all that matters is that this is also somebody's view. It, people, unfortunately, uh, in, in Ghana, in many ways, we have reached the point where we think it is right and it's good and it helps governance that it, you once drinks together lots and lots of un unpleasant words and throws it them out into the, 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 the public domain. It's a shame. It's a shame on the nation because we're not teaching our young people good things and because at the end, goodness and truth are the most important things. And we are losing sight of all that in politics and politicking becomes our excuse. Ah, but they said it, so me too, I'm saying it. This is my channel, I'm saying it. This is their channel. They said it, we are saying it. Who, who, who does it benefit? Does it benefit? If it benefits anybody, it benefits a few people. It does not benefit the nation. It befuddles every issue. It befuddles and obscures every discourse. We, these days, we don't even know how to debate anymore. 
we have to be shouting and we have to be insulting. And then you feel, ah, I spoke. No, we don't speak. All we do is to shout and, and insult. And that's not debate. That's not discussion. That's not discourse. And it's quite unproductive. This whole thing, all these reactions to uh, what President Mahama said, listen, at the end of the day, whether a judge is going to decide a case in one way or the other is between the law, the facts, and the judge's conscience. That's the spiritual part of it because you've sworn that you will do justice without fear, favor. And that is all that there is to it. You met in, in, in an answer to one of the questions, you talked about you not being a politician and politicians knowing or thinking how they want to go about their things. How do we get to the place where really we leave the judiciary to be what it should be? As I've already mentioned, the, that, the, the, the need to set up in addition to Process. the processes, the transparency that you talked yeah, about. Once you have that, you see, I'm not going to do give any lessons on how it's done in this place or in that place. But increasingly, increasingly, the, 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 and we are still part of the Commonwealth. And that's part of our, of our strength. In, increasingly in the Commonwealth, there's, there's great advocacy for each country looking seriously into whether you will call it a commission, whether you will call it a council, whatever you will call it. It's a, a body that is credibly independent and who's looking for merit-based outcomes. Because in the end, that is what helps the nation, not favoritism, not tribalism. It is merit-based. One would say that would would be right to say indeed that you have seen the political regimes of the Fourth Republic. I mean, you yes, the ones before. <laughs> <laughs> you just referred, yes, you just referred to the appointment by former President Jerry John Rawlins in 1995, and then you were nominated uh, also by the former President Kofu for the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, uh, the current president uh, appointed you as the chief justice mm -hmm. of the country. Where do you see the governance and politics of the country going, having seen all these regimes and what is happening currently? I will say that in the early years of, the, of this constitution, a lot of us who were old enough to be looking uh, forward to to great changes were under the belief that on the basis of the constitution that we have, it's not perfect, but it has, it has seen us through for 30 plus years, right? Well, but people are saying the executive oh, yes, has too much power. So it does. should I be viewed it right now? Yes, 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 yes. And, that, and that's the, exactly the point I was going to make because the, the constitution is, basically just a basic law. It is a framework. And then when you have a frame, when, you, when something is a framework, that means you're going to, it's, a, it's the infrastructure on which you're going to be building the, 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 the structure and the superstructure. Isn't that it? Yes. But we have been too happy with the framework. It's like you've framed your house and uh, put in plywood and all that to hold it, but you were planning, if you were going to build it uh, in the European style, you were planning to, to put the, the, the more solid, the sheet rock on the front and on the back to give it a stronger uh, 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 position. Yes, we, we have been too much into, oh, it says in paragraph this, this and that, but we have not gone into the constitutionalism, the ism of it, so as to build strong institutions. And the ism of it is what exactly? The ism of, yeah, to what is our ism? As a nation, what is our ism? 
What is our national ethos? What is our collective belief? What is that belief which when, when all else is said and done, that becomes the conversation stopper? Hmm? I don't know. Not anymore. When I was growing up, it was purely nationalism. We are Ghanaians. And nothing but the best is good enough for Ghana. That is how we who you know I was how old was I was in I was in class two, class three uh, in 1957. Yeah, I started in 1955. So yeah, I was in class two, class three. There were so many changes in the academic year and all that. Sometimes I get confused myself. But I know I started in 1955 and we became independent in 1957. And, you know, you learned your national anthem. You learned your, they, they told you about your, you saw your flag being flown. You, you saw so many new things and, and Ghana, 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 Ghana. And I still get tears in my eyes when there's the drum roll. And they say, da, 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 gives me goosebumps because it was so special to us in those days. After starting with God Save Our Gracious Queen, and then suddenly they play that music and they, they say, this is now our anthem because Ghana is a, 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 an independent, independent country. And then in 1960, they, then we became a republic that had to be explained to us. We had to have lessons as schools, at least in my school, they, they taught us what being a republic was as against being uh, independent and, and purely independent. And, and what previously from 1957 to 30th June, uh, 1960, and then we become independent on July 1st, right? So for me, I'm one of those people who believes that in the first July should not be any other day other than Republic Day. Because there's they can talk about First Republic, Second Republic, Third Republic, whatever. We got we became a republic and ceased to have the monarch of England as our sovereign leader on that date. That's when we became a republic. And there's only one Republic Day. The others were military interventions, which were aberrant. And we should not even glorify them by calling ourselves Fourth Republic, this Republic, that Republic. No, we are Ghana. And we became the Republic of Ghana on that day. I mean, listening to you, you're obviously proud of the years that are behind. But I'm coming back to my question of where do you see the governance and the politics of this country going? Where do I see it going? I don't see it. it that's why I was asking, what is our ism? Because I do not see on a day to day basis. Uh, I do not see uh, or, or you want me to simply describe, be descriptive or prescriptive. To be prescriptive, I don't see the indis, any indices that will help me to, to say that we are moving towards this. We're moving towards a country, becoming a country which is truly, truly, truly homogeneous. People talk about nationalism. People talk about patriotism. People talk about all of these things. Mm -hmm. Do we anymore? I, you know, have the time when you listen. When uh, uh, that's why I'm asking, what is our common thing? What what binds? What is binding us together now? Because building strong institutions, institutions that are are strong in themselves, despite whoever is in is is the the individual in power, the political party in power, strong civil service where you get quality service to the nation, this, regardless of who's in power. We, from one day to the next, uh, after 7th uh, January, the only difference is that there's a new minister 
up there. But after that, it is the same people, but they are giving out quality work and quality output because it doesn't matter who is in charge. What matters is that they are, they are keeping the trust that was placed in them when they were given the appointment they are occupying. Do I get the understanding that you seem to have a feeling now we have just change of government and not necessarily do Absolutely. Yeah. That be, that's why I'm asking. What's our ethos? What's the, for that matter, for that matter, what is the ism for NPP? What's the ism for NTC? There are some who claim to be socialism and so on and so forth. But really, what's the difference? What's the difference? People joke and say the value is the same. Hmm. Yeah, because... Um, governance is, you know, good governance is not happening yet anymore. The good governance requires that systems are put in place. One of the, one of the strongest things that have been done and that this <coughs> constitution has been the passage of the financial, Public Financial Management Act. But even, even there, I was, you know, I attended some of the conferences and the meetings and the workshops that took place as the, uh, the, the, that those sets of laws were being put in place. The uh, outcomes, the expected outcomes are not necessarily what we are seeing, but at least it's there and the law is there. And if, when it is uh, properly applied and enforced, it works. And, but it's been in fits and starts. But there should have been, it, it's one of the most, um, uh, uh, to me, one of the most important quality management tools, financial quality management tools that we have in this country. We should have more of those where you know that if, if, if everybody is being law abiding, you know that if you're making a procurement, these are the steps. Everything has been properly laid out. If it's more than X amount, you do it this way. If it's, and, and so on and so forth. So we need to build stronger institutions. We need to establish clear standards, clear processes, clear goals, clear objectives, clear uh, um, pro procedures, and stick to them, and stick to them. And then when you've practiced it for a while, you're, you're constantly, because to sustain quality, is you, you must be always evolving. You must be always evolving, but every if every evolution must have within it a qualitative factor. And having mentioned that uh, the Electoral Commission opened the door, as it were, to the limited voter registration exercise, and it seems to be buffeted with a lot of legal issues, NDC and some other position parties think that, listen, the Constitution requires of you to ensure that we have adequate centres so it's easy for people to, to register. But you've restricted these or this very exercise to your district offices. And there's even a private citizen who is also fouled. And I will just go through... I I'll read a bit of the uh, probably two of the reliefs the parties are seeking. And like I said, it's the NDC, the CPP, APC, uh, the LPG and GCPP. If you look at the first one, the nature of the relief sought as follows. A declaration that upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 42 and 45A and E of the 1992 Constitution of the Republic and of Ghana and Regulation 2, Sub-Regulation 2A, 
and B and Regulation 31 of the Public Elections Registration of Voters Regulations 2016 CI-91 as amended by CI-126, the Electoral Commission of Ghana, the defendant herein in registering voters, shall designate registration centers that are suitable and accessible to every eligible Ghanaian who is desirous of exercising his or her constitutional right to be registered as a voter. I'll just add the C before you come in with your comment. A declaration that upon a true and proper interpretation of Articles 45A, 45E and 42 of the Constitution, the decision of the second defendant to undertake the 2023 limited or continuous voter registration at the district offices of the second defendant instead of undertaking same on the basis of electoral areas will result in voter suppression, particularly in rural constituencies of the country, and is thus unconstitutional as it violates the rights of the first-time voters to register and vote. Again, I have a qualified person before me who interprets the Constitution. How used you, to used, used to. to interpret the constitution how do you understand this this very case and by the way the electoral commission still went ahead even before the case could be determined the exercise is ongoing yeah it's uh, the, 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 the elect uh, anyway the electoral commission now has a constitutional work to do and unless a court stops him stops her once she starts, she has the power to proceed with it. That's best to start off with. So you, you don't that's see anything really, wrong with going ahead, although a case has been filed at the court? It, it, because um, there is, it, it, that, there's nothing that, that no court has yet issued an order for her, for her not to proceed with what she's doing. That that is that is it, because there are certain processes that she's supposed to, you know she's supposed to announce and do this and state and and once one can see that she's doing that, that's it. But beyond this, I'm not going to really talk about this case, because it's before the court. It's sub judice. It's been. It's a matter that's. I was just asking your interpretation and, of the provisions quoted by the applicant. Yeah, but isn't that exactly what one is asking? They are asking the court to do. It's there's it, there's only it's only the Supreme Court that has the power to interpret. You've been at the Supreme Court before. I'm, I'm no longer there. How do you understand it? How do I understand what? The, the 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 provisions quoted to defend the case that the EC is being unconstitutional. No, but you see, what they want, what is being asked for, requires certain nuances. It's nuanced because uh, if what's what's the um, give me the the provision the but, provisions yeah. they talk about they talk about articles forty two and 45A and E, and also add the bit about regulation 2, sub-regulation 2A and B, and regulation 31 of the public elections uh, regulation 2016. Go ahead to talk about CI-91 yes. as amended. But um, regulate it with, I'm, look, I'm looking at the, which, I'm looking at the constitution because I don't have the, regulations here but the constitution is the fundamental law and uh, it says uh, re, uh, 45 what it quotes 45a and then to 40... compile the register of and e. e to undertake programs for the expansion of the registration of voters yes but it also quotes article 42 article 42 is also quite uh, it's the is the is the first is the statement which sets out the because the, the 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 chapter is entitled representation of the people isn't that right mm -hmm. and then the sub the subtitle is the um, the right to vote and uh, 
every citizen has the right to vote. Yes. But they feel that the EC restricting... Uh, but the see, that, I said it, that is it. The claim is nuanced. That is why there's going to be interpretation done by those properly clothed with the constitutional power to interpret the constitution. Feel. Feel. Is the feeling right or is the feeling misguided? That's for the court to determine. It's not for me. Let me go to one of the places where you rose up to be the president of, which is the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Really, what, what, what is it there for? Of course, bearing you can interpret from its name to, interp to implement uh, human rights of the people within the continent or those who have ratified the, the provisions of this very court. But you were there before. Yes, the, 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 the first, the African Charter. See, you have to first know where the whole thing is coming from. There's the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which sets out a body of rights and actually also sets out a body of duties. We always talk about the rights and forget about the duties. Our constitution also contains duties. We also forget about that too. Um, but in any case, and in that, in that uh, instrument, they set out uh, a, a mechanism for the promotion and protection of these rights. But that mechanism was the African Commission on human and people's rights, which, but they didn't give them judicial powers. They, they had, they have investigative powers and, uh, and then they make re re recommendations to member states. Now the, the African charter, everyone has, every, every African country has ratified it. The African, the, the, the court protocol uh, it's not all countries that have ratified, but it also contains a, a clause which we call the clawback clause. You give the you give with your right hand and you seize with your you claw back with your left hand. What does that mean in terms of, in terms of its work? Um, it limits the scope and uh, and the ability of the court to uh, to receive and hear and make determinations on cases that are brought before it because um, it's, 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 individuals can come before the court with their human rights case only if their country has made a declaration enabling the, the court to take those cases. Otherwise, it will be maybe another another country can bring a matter before against another country before the court on human rights. I'm not aware of any mm. kind of thing being done. Or the African Commission can also not the the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. We 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 normally call it the Banjul Commission because that's where its head office is. And uh so they have also uh, seized the court on a number of of significant in a number of significant cases. But that would be after they've done the their investigation, they've sent in their report. Nothing has been done about it. Then they seize the court, and they have to fight the case before the court. I know that, uh, like every international court, there will be limits, there will be jurisdictions and all of that how would you say i mean having been there before how would you say uh the the court has effectively played its role especially in the midst of a number of coups on the continent um i'm not sure whether unless one well one can always link or you could even add a bit of abuse of uh, the citizens' rights by certain types of governments that we have on the continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say because coups are not necessarily done on behalf of the citizens' rights. It's done uh, for all kinds of 
reasons and mostly economic and 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 and, and so on and so forth so um it, the fact that there are you know it's, it's like we're going back into the 70s the late 60s and the 70s with cool here yeah, cool there cool there it's i find it a very retro retrogressive retrogressive because um one had thought that on the strength of the african charter by this time every country every member of the african union has a constitution and they do have constitutions and these constitutions contain provisions very very similar or this or or even better in proving upon the provisions of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and have also set, they would set up the proper mechanisms for, for, for the enforcement and the protection of these rights. Uh, in our, our constitution does that pretty well and, uh, and enables uh, that's why we. That's why you can go to the high court. In fact, individual you can go to the high court to enforce your personal rights if you think it's something is being done or has been done or is about to be done against your rights. So obviously, when you look at the laws that we have, individual countries and this African court that we are talking about, they are spelled out clearly. Just like you have the European court uh, earlier in our conversation, you talked about the inter- The inter-American- Exactly, court. Human, right. What is it about this continent and possibly the people that makes it almost difficult or impossible for us to really implement whatever it is that we set out to do Definitely. because you have leaders who come in they know they have two terms before the, their terms run out they change provisions and they stay on it, it's i think it all boils down to governance and uh, that's why i every time we mention governance i always want to say good governance because if you have uh, wonderful constitutions and you do not have good governance. Good governance is very broad because it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's it basically is how the people are governed, how well the people are governed, how, how, transpar how much transparency there is, how much accountability there is, how predictable are the processes and the procedures. And um, as for those who come and change the law and then some of them make themselves for life, others double the duration or it's for two terms and they add more terms, unlimited terms and all that. And they will tell you it's because the people want it. I cannot speak for them, but I believe that what has gone wrong in Africa is that once again we have not built the up the framework the framework has been there we have not put the proper structures in place in some of the countries uh you know some of the cases that uh, if, if i remember one of the very early cases we did at the african court uh um whilst permitting freedom of expression, freedom of this, freedom of association, uh, this, they, they, they actually put in their constitution that you cannot have independent um, candidacy in the, for, 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 for presidential elections. You, you have to, you must have a party. A party, you know. So one of the, the, the uh, declarations in, in, in our decision was was that just as you have the right to there's firstly the right to participate in in governance in public in the public uh, uh, arena effectively and and completely and uh, that also means you have a right to to be a political person but in exercising that right 
You have a right to associate. You also have a right not to associate. Would you say that this recommendation or rule has been binding on African countries? Those it's, who have ratified the provisions? It, it, it is binding. As far as I know, it has not been appealed again. It, it has not been, no, there's no appeal from the, uh, from the court. Side. But it, has, it, 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 it remains a, a, a declaration of the court. You're now raising issue of um, compliance. Yes. But the country did, did go through the process to amend their constitution. They did. Congratulations on that. Uh, let me, we are talking about human rights here, and you just talked about right of association or to associate. Associate or not associate. Or not to associate. Yes. What's your view or what do you think about the current, uh, the bill currently before parliament, what many refer to as anti-gay bill? Should it pass? You're asking for my personal view? You can oh, answer it as a judge I, or as, I, a, as a, 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 a person. I, I, I'm not, I'm no longer, I'm a retired <laughs> a judge. A retired judge. Yes. I believe that, one, every group of people, now here, that's where we're coming to people. <laughs> every group of people have certain common values. And in fact, in the African Charter, the, the pre preservation of, of, of healthy cultural values are upheld. The same way as it's the duty of every member of the, uh, every signatory of the African Charter to also make sure that all harmful practices and beliefs are also gotten rid of. That's also there. Because every, every uh, nation has the duty to protect its people, protect the things that unite them. Personally, one of the values that I think uh, we must protect is the value of human life human life and the continuation of the species. What does that mean in this context? It, it means that you, uh, uh, not, you're not, I'm not going to take the term in terms of you're expected, but you, you're, you're, you're being here. We are expecting that you will, you will continue through your offspring right? Your spirit will continue and your genes will continue and so on and so forth. So you're for the bill? I have not, I, I cannot say I am for or against it because I have not read the details of it. See, sometimes some of us choose to be very selective in what we burden, the little bit of space we've got left in the, in the gray matter. We're very selective. If I have to, for example, review and critique the bill, I'll do it and do a good job with it. And if you had told me that we would talk about it, I would take the trouble. But I'm talking in general terms. Yes, it yeah, is so the right we... and duty of us to replicate so, so it be, be fruitful, increase and multiply and replenish the earth. I'm a Christian. I believe in that. Yes. And so I'm not necessary. I'm not going to uh, encourage any uh, practices and lifestyles that do not assure the sustenance and the continuity of the, let's say, the Ghanaian portion of the human race. People are concerned about the implications that uh, Ghana could face should the country go ahead to pass the bill. It being what? Some, they will come and invade us. They will, economic, throw, economic. They will throw an, uh, new, <laughs> a neutron bomb at us. <laughs> economic. Maybe it will do us good. 
Maybe it will enable us to now look more creatively into our resources and what we can do for ourselves. We've been so dependent on external uh, uh, in, inflow, in external, so externally sourced inflows for far too long, for far too long. If I don't, if I'm not going to, if we are not going to allow men to marry men and women to marry women, and because of that, what? You won't give us money. It's even a shame of, on us that we even think we need that much money, that somebody will think that they have the right and power to tell us how to make that sort of decision. How would you assess the current economy now between the time you participated in the DDEP protest and now? As I've said, I'm not an economist. I went to law school. <laughs> I went to law school because uh, my math is not good. I, I didn't go to business school. I, I, econom economy, I leave it to the economists. Finances, finance, I leave it to the financiers. If I'm heading an institution, I take the advice of those who know, and then I advise myself according to the law. Right now, I'm a private citizen, and uh, prices are still high. All I, I can do is to thank the Lord that I'm able to, as we put it in Akan, my hand can go from my bowl into my mouth. And um, in, 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 in my household, for me, it's been very good. Because all these years, I keep telling them, uh, when I go to shop, I, I buy Ghana. So there are shops I go to because I want to buy Ghanaian products. So uh, now when my daughter goes to shop on my behalf, yeah, she'll buy bongo rice. She will buy locally made rice because I prefer it anyway. But they had gotten themselves used to foreign rice, you know, rice which left the field about seven, eight years ago. And no, I like the Ghana. But would you say things are better for the pensioners, including yourself? Better for the pensioners in what way? Well, I don't know about those who signed up, but I know that uh, they, uh, after some delays, in the, up to the middle of the year after some delays. And so there was picketing going on at that time. The only reason you didn't see me with my picket was because I was uh, visiting my sister in, in Sweden. But uh, I was keeping track of what was going on. And as far as I know, there's no, there are no arrears. And therefore, uh, yes, yeah, all quiet on the Western Front so far. You, you, you said things, prices are high. Uh, there was a report that inflation has gone down again from 43 to around 41 or so. My dear girl, you go to the same market as I do, I, I suppose. Now, in, if, in real effect, in real effect, the difference, the price difference between 43 and 40 what? One hovering around that place. <laughs> does it does it translate realistically in anything other than that you get some extra coins? Uh, that's not what we one is looking for. But but I want what I want to say is that I really really um, would would like that whatever can be done to to strengthen our economy, because, because uh, the little bit of economics I, I one reads about, it's difficult to fathom why we should have these difficulties. Part of it is because we have developed bad habits. So what can we do about those bad habits? Can we, can we uh, live within our means? I'm a, I'm, I, I always say I'm Presbyterian. If you don't have it, don't try to spend it. You know, never, never a, a borrower should you be. Yes, because those who, who go borrowing go a sorrowing. Well, we are a sorrowing. And 
uh, you cannot convince me with any fancy arguments that, uh, oh, we've borrowed all this and we are in this much debt because we are, we are building roads, we are doing this, we're doing that, we're doing that, we're doing that, we're building more schools, we're doing all that. Now, you ask yourself, the, the inputs for the cement that we used to do the building, where is it from? The road building equipment, where, where are they from? The road contractors, where are they from? The, so you, we borrow to also now buy more external things in, in, into the system. And then um, in 20 years time, where will our children be? And, and where will the economy be for our children? I would like assurance that in 20 years time, because we will do this and this and this and this and that, this is what we are predicting or we are projecting. This is where the, the nation will be. Your final words, Her Ladyship. My final words. I wish that everybody will love Ghana a bit more. I'm not asking for self-sacrifice and all that. But everybody will love Ghana a bit more. Will every, in everything that we do, we our, our our litmus paper will be now face. How is this going to help the Republic of Ghana? How is this going to lift us out of where we are and take us where? We want to be this thing that this person has said, and I want to respond in like. In what way will it improve the economy of Ghana? Let's let's use the Republic of Ghana as an entity, not as uh, NDC NPP. No, Ghana is this good for Ghana? Yes, it is. Why? Do you think it's good for Ghana because of this and that and that and that? And sometimes the reasoning will have nothing. And the reasoning should also, not sometimes, should never have anything to do with politics. If we will stop politicizing, huh, even whether it will rain or not in Ghana now, it's politics. Oh, where we say, and people soon to talk by heart. You know, if I heard somebody saying that, it will not surprise me. Because that is where we have, we, the, the depths to which we have dragged politics. Politics really is supposed to be exactly as they say it in G. Can be. Nothing can be. And then you say it, I say it, and maybe we see the gem of truth in the middle. But now truth doesn't seem to matter. So goodness, truth, beauty. Let's pursue those. Thank you so much, uh, your ladyship, for speaking to us on Town Hall Talk. You're welcome. And that will be our conversation tonight on Town Hall Talk. As you just heard there, uh, we were talking with her ladyship, Sophia Akufo, a former chief justice of the Republic of Ghana. Uh, she was also a former judge at the Supreme Court, as well as a, a number of accolades that she's had or added to her her career or professional life and of course we talked about the Wugri novel issue that is still raging and the people appearing before the ad hoc committee set up by parliament uh, we went into the comment uh, from the former president John Mahama the response uh, by President Akufuado and the backlash after the response because of the venue uh, the president used in responding to what the GBA referred to as a legal issue and of course some other critical issues on the economy that we've been talking about. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you so much for joining us on Town Hall Talk today. Join us again next week.